Okay, so I'm here with Karen Tweed. Thanks for coming on the show. You're very welcome, and it's nice to be here. Um, and you're actually uh, the first accordion player I have on the show, I think. Uh, so it's about time. <laughs> <laughs> and you're an accordion player. Yeah. I mean, what are you it's, thinking of? <laughs> it's ridiculous. Uh, but I'm really happy that um, that you could come on because ever since I started uh, playing around with Irish music myself, yeah, uh, ten years ago maybe, uh, you've been one of my biggest inspirations for sure. Um, and I mean. This happened a lot in the world of uh, uh, Irish music on the piano accordion in recent years, I find. But like 10 years ago, there weren't that many people who were doing it and getting a lot of exposure. So uh, I remember it was mainly you and, of course, Phil Cunningham and uh, Alan Kelly, I think. That was like my three main um, inspirations. Uh, And you all had very different styles. uh, And I've always found your particular style really interesting and and very different from uh, well most of the other players on the scene um I, I, at least i found that you have something uh, that, that not that many other people have so i'd really i'd love to go into some of that stuff in detail although i'll try to not make this too accordion centric and nerdy um oh let's make it really really yeah. accordion and nerdy yeah you know it? what yeah yeah <laughs> It's, that's um, yeah, but there's there's so much fiddle nerding going on anyway. So they, I, I'm sure people <laughs> could take a bit of accordion. So, but uh, why don't we start off um, uh, for the listeners who aren't uh, yet familiar with uh, your work and your background? Maybe you could give us um, an introduction to to yourself and um, and your musical uh, journey. That's a big question. Well, <laughs> big question. Uh, how to make that into a short answer? Um, it doesn't need to be short. Well, okay. Well, I started the melodica, actually, at the age of seven. You know, this long piano keyboard thing that you blow into that's plastic. Yeah. Because I had a teacher at school who didn't want me to play the piano for some reason. Anyway, he sort started me on the melodica, and I uh, really enjoyed that very much. And uh, about three years after that, I then... Um, Actually, what happened was my sister came home with a piano accordion because a guy called Joe Cole was in our local church hall and he ran a Scottish marching band because in Scotland there's a lot of accordion, piano accordion marching bands there. So I saw that and wanted one immediately, as you always do, whatever your older sister has, you want it. <laughs> I think. Well, I so did anyway. I, 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 and, I, so, sorry, I don't think I've ever seen a piano accordion marching band. Is, is that common in the... It's very common in the north hmm. of Ireland. It's very common in uh, Scotland as well. And, so is it, is it um, just accordions or any other instruments? Just, uh, you have piano accordions and uh, snare drums and a bass drum at the back. Oh, and nice. what you also have a lot of in Britain, and actually I think all over the world, but certainly in Britain, is you have accordion piano accordion orchestras. And that's uh, entirely a separate scene from folk music and uh, anything at all really um so i didn't actually know about those accordion orchestras but i did know about the scottish marching bands because where i lived in england there was a small place and unusually many many scottish people lived there in the middle of england because they had a steelworks and a lot of the scottish workers came down to work at the steelworks anyway so i got into the accordion that way and uh, my teacher then said to my parents that i needed uh, more challenge more challenging Mm -hmm. and so i ended up going to an accordion teacher who played button accordion called John Whelan. He couldn't read music and he didn't play the bass, but he was a fantastic Irish music specialist, I suppose. Uh, So our lessons were done by ear. And I learnt, I suppose, from a lot of button accordion players at that time, there weren't, there was only a couple of piano accordion players who you would aspire to in Irish music that I knew of at the time. Uh, That was Kevin Taylor and Mm -hmm. Helen Igo, John Gibney, uh, Chris Cronin, Great, great players, but um, yeah, quite thin on the ground. So I got into that a little bit and then uh, just playing Irish music. But in the middle of all this at school, I was told I couldn't study music because the accordion wasn't a serious instrument. Oh, really? So you would need to have a first instrument. And I, I only had the accordion. I didn't have another instrument. I didn't sing. I didn't play anything else. So I kind of thought, okay, that's fine. Well, I like art, so I'll do art. So I went on an art career and went to art college and carried on playing in sessions and things and uh, doing competitions like you do as a kid. And, um, and then 
uh, I finished art training, became an art teacher, and I was about to settle down quite happily in my mm -hmm. mid-20s and then got a phone call late one night from Ian Carr, guitarist, now living in Sweden, uh, who knew me from sessions and said, uh, are you free this weekend because we need an accordion player for a band called the Catherine Tickell Band, which was a very uh, amazing band, actually, and was doing very well at the time in British folk music. So I joined the band um, as a kind of stopgap, but <laughs> ended up changing my life completely by joining the band full time and then becoming a professional musician. And that's how it kind of happened. And I, I've always been interested in lots of different musics. And because I suppose I thought by my mid 20s, I was never going to be in an Irish music band. And it, I didn't know of any piano accordion players in an Irish music band. It was no. always button accordion players. True. And Actually, there weren't so many females playing in bands at that time. There's female vocalists, but there weren't many female instrumentalists. It wasn't really, wasn't a common thing, I suppose, that I knew of. In sessions, certainly, I knew loads of female players, but not so many in bands. And, of course, it's all changed now. Sharon Shannon started and mm. Phil Cunningham and all of these people. Phil was playing since he was about 12, I think. Yeah. <laughs> and he was huge in the Scottish folk scene. But the weird thing about Irish music in England is that when you played at that time, Irish music in England, you didn't listen to other music. You just listened to Irish music because it was all uh, expat Irish families who were missing Ireland. My mother was Irish, my dad was English. And so they, they just wanted to listen to the music of their homeland. Yeah. And a li probably a little bit of country and western. So I, he I heard more about pop music and people like Frank Sinatra and Shirley Bassey than I ever did about any other kind of folk music. I didn't know there was English folk music. Can you believe that? I never heard a note of English folk music till I went to college at 19. <laughs> so that's bizarre. I didn't, I didn't, hadn't even heard of Astor Piazzolla till I was nearly in my mid thirties. No, so okay. it's, I had a kind of sheltered life, I think, musically in one way in folk music, but I always listened because my dad loved swing and jazz and the classic ballad people like Nat King Cole and people like that. So I was always listening to that kind of stuff. My elder brothers were always listening to rock and pop and Joni Mitchell and Black Sabbath mm. and all of these people, Led Zeppelin. And um, and I just listened to whatever my accordion teachers told me to listen to, which is mainly Irish music or what they used to call continental music, which was kind of Musette Waltz things, which I really liked. Yeah. Does that give you enough detail? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> No, but um, but uh, yeah, what what you said there about um, there not being that many piano accordion players in bands and like uh, yeah, role models to aspire to. I mean, it's it's funny what you said about button accordion players because uh, when people really want to give me a great compliment about my playing on the piano accordion, they would say that oh, you sound almost like a button accordion player. Yeah, <laughs> you know what I mean. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I've had that one. That's like, hilarious, what, isn't what, it? It's great. What, what do you think that's about? Well, it's because the button accordion has been so huge in Irish music, and also the piano accordion um, in the early days, I think, was mainly associated with the Northern Ireland accordion band we were talking about, which mm. was a Protestant thing. Yeah. So. Maybe, maybe the button accordion was seen as the Catholic accordion and the, the piano accordion was seen as the, the Protestant accordion, you know, because it was part of the Orange Marches, which was very pro-Protestant, you know. Yeah. Um, that was a big thing, actually. So it was interesting be, being part of that and not being aware that there was any kind of political content to it at all, no. really. Um, but these days, that's very different. There's a lot of amazing piano accordion players playing, young accordion players playing. Sure. And these days, it's uh, that every, everybody's much more visible because of, like, obviously the internet is so much bigger now and social media and. Um, like yeah, and also when I, I mean, when I was first playing, I mean, this is you know, <laughs> wow, over forty, forty eight years ago or whatever, um, that it wasn't. It, it, you'd never think of doing a band as a career. You know, you think you, nobody would in, in in England would think okay. of being in a folk band. That wasn't seen as a viable career. That was for older people, mostly men. Yeah. In, you know, the chieftains. And from for me, I met the chieftains. I went to a concert. And, you know, went to meet them afterwards with my little autograph book and everything. Thought they were amazing. One of the first concerts I ever went to was about eight, and mm. um, they they seemed like. Gandalf out of Lord of the Rings, you know, they were really <laughs> old, which yeah. which they feel it, that feels when you're eight years old. Somebody who's twenty feels old, let alone somebody in their fifties or whatever yeah. forties. So it was for older people who were wise and yeah, that's interesting up there and all of that kind of stuff. So it, there was, you know, there. 
I, there weren't that many bands about. There weren't that many LPs about. So when when an L, I'm from an era that LPs were first, you know, were were, were the big CD of the day. So mm. you used to get an LP and you'd learn every tune off it. Well, you could because there was only about five coming out a month, probably not even in Irish music terms. You, and your parents didn't have that much money, so you couldn't buy. You know, there wasn't the kind of you got all these kind of platforms now where you can buy all of this stuff or you can get it for free. You know, that just yeah. wasn't available. So no. you you only listened to what was just coming out, which was mainly, for me, the Bothy Band, uh, Kevin Burke and Jackie Daly, Martin O'Connor was blowing my mind. There wasn't anything on the piano accordion at all. So, and I, it's funny, you were saying also about role models. You know, this this word is, it, sorry, this label, world models, is banded around now. I didn't know what a role model was when I was, you know, that, that, we, that wasn't spoken about when I was a teenager, who you aspired to. No. You just loved what you loved. I wanted to be Stevie Wonder. <laughs> That's what yeah. I wanted to be. I wanted to play, I wanted to play like Stevie Wonder plays a harmonica, and I've never stopped that. That's my goal. You know, if I could ever do a, a solo like Stevie Wonder plays and make it so soulful and make it so full of feeling and cheeky and flirtatious, that, that, and play Irish music like that, then I, you know, then I've I've uh, I've got to where I want to be, and I'm still miles off of that. Ah, oh, but that's quite interesting to hear, actually, because when you say that, like, I yeah, I can hear some Stevie Wonder in your playing, like uh, <laughs> the kind of like the, the the playfulness and stuff that you hear on "Isn't She Lovely," and yeah, that's that's a good transition into your uh, into um, your style, your playing style, uh, because what I am. I suppose, like a lot of people, the first thing we notice about your playing is your very uh, innovative and kind of personal way of using the bass side of the accordion. Uh, well, it's interesting, the bass side of the accordion, even now, um, it makes me smile that when people ask to come for lessons or come to a workshop, I, I often say, what, you know, what's your, what's your big thing you want to play, you know? if you could have a dream. And mainly, they might have a tune they want to learn, but often they say, can you show me how to not play umpa bass? Yeah. You know, because that's all piano accordions are taught to do. Who invented that? Who, we don't know who said you can only go umpa, 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 you know. And there's nothing wrong with umpa, but it doesn't mean that's the only thing you can do. And I was very interested always in sessions with guitarists. I was very, very blessed to play with some amazing guitarists like, Ian Carr and Ivan Militich, these were just in sessions, you know, mm. and to hear what they did. And they didn't just go, dun ching, dun ching. Even, although when I went to Shetland, I loved it because Piri Willie Johnson was doing the, the, the kind of boom ching style, if you like, the um Yeah, the kind of the, the jazz, jazzy style. Yeah. That mm. jazzy stuff, but, but they used the jazz chords. And I was like, whoa, because suddenly again, with my dad's influence from all of the kind of swing jazz era that he loved of the 30s and the 40s, I was suddenly hearing these chords. I didn't know what they were. I didn't, I, I still don't know what they are, really. I'm not very good on <laughs> labels or theory of music, but I know what I like, as we mm. all do. We've all been listening to music. And I was like, oh, you know, they weren't just doing the Charlie Lennon, beautiful chords and kind of boom ching style on the piano, which is fine. But they were putting in these really, really, what I th felt were very sexy jazz yeah. chords all over mm. the place going, Oh, hang on! What's that all about? What you know? I, I was getting distracted from playing the tunes because I was hearing what they were doing, and then you, I I heard Ian Carr, and Ian Carr actually started off playing the harmonica and then went onto the piano accordion, but then took up the guitar because that was kind of um, more cool, he said. <laughs> but and similarly, I was meeting musicians on the road, I suppose, like Catherine and Ian and lots of these amazing people. And when I asked them about their what they liked, you know, they, they often wouldn't say, like Ian wouldn't say another guitarist. He would he would be talking about Funkadelic or he would be talking about, you know, pop, pop musicians, jazz musicians. He used to love, um, uh, is it uh, John Sermon? People like that? I can't remember. Anyway, but often when you meet p great musicians, they often don't cite another musician who plays their instrument no you know, that's interesting they yeah. talk about somebody else and if you and you know I'm, I used to I go through phases of reading biographies and it's really interesting to read musician biographies because often the musicians you know if you read Charlie Parker or people like that they're often really uh, they really aspire to another musician who who doesn't play their instrument it's somebody else like me you know I wanted to sound like Stevie Wonder he doesn't play piano accordion <laughs> and it's not because there weren't piano accordions about and even now you know I love Richard Galliano I love Karen Street I love Maria Callanini and all of these people but and Alan Kelly fabulous fabulous players but actually 
you know, Stevie's still got it. Yeah. And if you listen to people who are really, really good at playing Irish music, I've just been listening to Ryan Malloy and Fergal, and they, they're very playful. That's what, yeah. that's what Stevie Wonder does. So it, it's that same kind of thing, and it's what turns you on. If, if you like a more slower style or a, or a less flirtatious style, that's fine too, but that's just kind of what gets me excited. That's interesting, I find, like maybe now that you mention it, that like the players that stick out to me in in Irish music, but also I guess in any genre, they usually have something uh, unique or personal or different in a way. And, mm-hmm. and maybe the best way to 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 kind of get that um, that thing into your playing is to to listen to other to things with outside the the tradition, uh, not being afraid of finding your own style, maybe. Um, well, we are, aren't we? We're often afraid of finding our own style because we always think we're not as good as the people we want to be like. <laughs> That's the problem, isn't it? My um, <coughs> John Whelan emigrated to America when I was 14 <clears throat> and I was devastated because I thought, well, what am I going to do now? I don't have a teacher anymore. And he said to me, um, it's actually a good a good move, Karen, because you're starting to sound like me and that's no good. You have to find your own voice. And to find your own voice you now need to put away all of your piano accordion or accordion recordings, LPs, in the loft, don't even look at them, and listen to anything but the accordion. And oh, and concentrate on one instrument and just really copy it, really copy that player, just copy every little nuance. And when you can, when you can blend in with them, not hide behind them, but when you can blend in with them, then you're starting to learn Irish music. And he said, look at where... Look at the essence of the music you're trying to play. John was amazing. He's such a wise guy. And hmm. and he said, like for him, Irish music is about the fiddle, the flute, the voice, pipes. You know, it's not about the accordion. And so so to listen to that, so I listen to fiddles. You know, I just got into fiddles. I listened to one particular fiddle player and completely copied. And the reason that made sense to me at 14 was because I was already really interested in art and design and I was taught at in my art classes by my teacher uh, Pauline Miller at school she was talking about color she was talking about composition she was talking about you had to copy all the masters you had to copy all the masters mm. so um by copying the masters that's the biggest form of flattery but you were learning how they did what they did so John's saying go and copy another person like so so you're trying to do on the accordion what a fiddle's going to do so you are going to have a really unique voice and you're copying things you like don't copy a fiddle player you don't like why would you do that you know yeah. <laughs> nuts so so it's that kind of idea and mm. i remember sharon shannon being very into tommy peoples and she was really trying to listen because at that time of course we didn't have amazing slowdown we didn't have things on youtube you could slow down so she was listening at full speed to to- tommy peoples and working out exactly how he played his triplets and whether the three notes in the triplet would be slow, short, short, slow, slow, short. Or, I mean, it was just like the the mi- minute detail she was listening to was amazing. Mm. And I wasn't so into Tommy Peoples. I was more into <laughs> Kevin Burke. I'm a bit more of a sloth, you know. So I was really liking <laughs> this slow way of and, and not so much ornamentation and more about breathing. And I don't know that kind of that was what it was for me, that kind of idea. So so there that takes us to the harmonic side of things on the bass because I was already getting interested in what other guitarists, piano players were doing. I was listening to Irish music being played and backed on the piano. And I I was trying to work out, is this about color or is this about punctuation? Okay, so so then you have to, and that's because I suppose I'm always, I'm always thinking about art and drawing because I love it. And, you know, I wouldn't call myself a professional artist or anything, but I, I can't stop thinking or being being uh, affected. I think we all are affected by colour and line and design and and everything. So I think of that in, in music as well. It's about colour and it's about contrast and it's about... So is is the backing of Irish music... Here, here you go, listeners. <laughs> is the backing of Irish music about punctuation or about colour? Okay, For yeah. me, it had to be about colour. So playing umpa 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 didn't work anymore because when you play a reel that goes da 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 you can't go because it breaks up the breaks up the the flow of the music and you're to, in I'm sure it's the same in Norway in England you're taught to drive where you mustn't interrupt the flow of traffic that that <laughs> that thought 
has kept st stayed with me for such a long time. Music, you can't inter interfere with the flow of traffic. When you get ill or you get clots in your bloodstream, it interflows with your blood flow. So it's all about flow. It's all it, it's everything's related in that way. So, and the art I like is very flowing, or it can be abstract. It can be, but it's about hues and it's about things that make your heart sing. And there hasn't, there's not jaggy edges in it for me. That's that's the kind of stuff I like. I don't mind well, other people like other things. That's an interesting way of looking at backing in Irish music, uh, like uh, the contrast between punctuation and color. I haven't really thought of it that way, but now that you say it, like because the music already has rhythm, and obviously it has a lot of color. But I guess as an as a chord player or like a guitar player or a, a, the left hand of a, a chord, and you can you can add different colors. Mm -hmm. Well, it's like when I met Timo Alakatila, it was great meeting him because I, he's got the most incredible record collection. <laughs> and uh, we listened to a lot of music and I noticed the kind of stuff he was listening to. And we talked a little bit about Bill Evans, you know, mm -hmm. and I just started hearing people like Bill Evans. And I never thought I could do anything like that. I still don't. But I love the fact that he uses colour. Mm. And and then I got into ECM and, you know, all of these fantastic Norwegian jazz people, Esbjorn uh, Trio and, yeah, just fa fabulous, amazing, you know, and the way they, it's all about colour, really. And, but you have to have a rhythm as well. You know, you can't just play the notes. There has to be a rhythm. But we, but then we, we're playing dance music. We're playing dance music to people sitting down. Which mm. is really weird because it used to be played to get people to get up and dance, or it might, or music might be played to help people grieve or celebrate a wedding or whatever. But there, there was movement, you know, there was either emotional movement or there was physical movement. So that's that's very very important in what you're trying. I suppose you've got to think of the function. You know, I really love tango as well, and that's a very punctuated thing with the drama of when it comes in and when it gets like a mini Alfred Hitchcock movie. You know, you've got. To <laughs> <laughs> Got to kind of get those kind of edits in the right place, I suppose. But um, yeah, it's a lot about imagery. So, so getting back to this umpa thing, why why do we why do we play or not play umpa? I have to go back to what is the essence, like John said. So, the essence of Irish music for me, uh, or what it used to be when I first was growing up, I suppose, is that it was a very unison music. There was no harmonies it wasn't four part harmonies or massive chords like you get in Norwegian or Swedish music or whatever or Finnish music it was just pure unison melody line even mm. the button accordion players don't play their basses I think only Billy Kaminsky I mean there's a few more who do now but at that time so few people played it because the most important thing was getting the melody heard getting the melody heard and getting that amazing rhythm and dance and feel for that melody so why would I want to cut it up with and also it's really tiring going um part um part um part all the time so I, that's why i just started playing around with ideas trying to listen to what did the bothy band do what did listen to trina nidono she's got a very punctuated style on the piano but she doesn't play like any other piano player i know in irish music you know mm. and it's on a kind of more elect electronic kind of thing she's more akin to <laughs> superstition by stevie wonder than she is to charlie lennon but it's interesting that we think we have to play in a certain style because it's always been there but it actually, it hasn't always been there. This is a very new music. Irish music in its current form is very new, you know. And, yeah, and, and as you said, like it developed as a uh, unison type of music. Like there's no, like traditionally, there's no chords in Irish music. Uh, or, uh -huh. uh, that, and that, it's not usually written with that, that in mind, even though no, when you exactly. start looking... But when you start looking at some of the music, the Irish music I, that really gets me excited, you know, like... Um, uh, Finn by Dwyer and people like that. I mean, mm. that's that's just mental, mental cordially. But then you look at Finn by Dwyer's background. Finn by Dwyer moved to London, played the piano accordion, moved to the button accordion, played in the country and western band, and he had to play whatever the audience wanted in his band. And yeah. similarly with Jim, you know, Jimmy Shand up in Scotland, he was he re he redesigned his accordion because he realised everybody was starting to listen to much more chromatic music like Glenn Miller and people like that, I suppose, on the dance floors. So he mm. had to be able to play that. So he had to. So he then designed an accordion with buttons on one side, stradella bass on the other side, so he could play all of those chords. Uh -huh. you know? okay. hmm. um, and so the function became, it became, again, to the audience, to the dancing audience, so because otherwise you wouldn't get, you wouldn't get paid, you wouldn't get 
and and probably he was very they were both very interested in the music they were doing but it fed into the music they uh composed you know and if you listen to some i mean there's some really out there bonkers irish music that is still seen as traditional and yet when you look at it and compare it to stuff that you might hear that you might feel is more straightforward like the Tuller reel or yeah you know, you know the Kesh jig or whatever, and, and then you, you listen, listen to some Finbar Dwyer stuff, and you, stuff, and you, you listen, listen to some Paddy Kelly stuff. And these people didn't have a theoretical background, but what they were hearing and what they were playing was really different and really quite. I mean, for me, it's akin to some of these really bizarre pulse pieces you get in the north of Sweden. You know, the, yeah, <laughs> some of the, the tonality is fantastic. So, how would you then back that with a button accordion that's only really got twelve bases and only major chords that you can't? Mm. Interesting. But then, um, like what I hear in your bass style is that you're not going on par, but you're doing a lot of these syncopated things. And you're also use, using a lot of minor seven chords, which like took me a little while to figure out how you would actually do them because there's no chord, chord button on the on the accordion which has the minor seven. So you have to use like uh, a fourth chord and the second bass of the scale. Like, uh-huh. mm-hmm. So you can use but, a counter bass or you can use, like to get a minor seventh, if you think of how a minor seventh is made up, like E minor is E, G and B. Okay. That's yeah. kind of fairly straightforward, I think, for musicians. And to make the seventh on that scale, then you add the D, which is the seventh note in that scale on E minor. But if you are playing E, the bass note, which you can play in a couple of places on the piano accordion, then and you take that bass note away from the other notes, you are left with G, D, and B, which is a G major chord. So it's really easy to make on a on a Stradella bass. Now, most classical musicians would know that. Most jazz musicians would know that. Folkies wouldn't know that at all. But I only found out because Andy Cutting was using minor sevenths all over the place. And I was going, how can he How can he do these fantastic chords with only, I think he had 16 basses, and I've got 72. I can't do those chords. Yeah. <laughs> so I got him to sit, sit down and t- show me. He was using a limited palette. Again, going back to, you know, if I'm doing painting, sometimes you can do much more interesting paintings using a limited palette. If you think of Picasso's blue period. Mm. Then if you've got too many, too much choices. So Andy only had those bases. Andy was having to go in and out to use a diatonic player. Yeah. So he used what he had just by playing around and going, oh, that sounds kind of nice and that's kind of interesting. And started doing this whole minor seventh thing. And I realized that minor seventh was my favorite chord basically i mean mm. you know my style isn't really a style it's just lots of minor sevenths and lots of sustained chords that's it it's fairly <laughs> simple you can learn it in half an hour <laughs> <laughs> well, no but uh okay but going back to what you said about color because i, I found that to be a really interesting comparison or uh, way of looking at it like uh, because obviously a tune already has a color uh like in my mind at least um so how would how would you approach are you ever afraid of like adding too much color if, you know what i mean like concealing the the tune behind uh, like so that the, the backing would like be the main event and the tune only being um there you know what i mean is 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 that ever a concern of you no i don't think so um it's funny isn't it the way we make up our mind as to what works and what doesn't work really um I think I've had some really, I've been very blessed to have some really fantastic teachers who made me feel very unprecious about what I do. So you've got to remember that, uh, I think Martin Hayes said this, that the best music is yet to come, always, always. Okay, so then you, then that lets you off the hook. It's great because you can you can put down as many ideas or as much colour as you like and... and then you can rub it away again and, and find out which bits you want to unearth. I've just I've just started doing quite a lot of writing music uh, well, I, I still think I'm writing tunes, but uh, it's about jellyfish. I'm very interested in jellyfish at the moment. So I'm, write, I'm trying to write music for jellyfish, you know. So you, when you're watching jellyfish, this is the kind of music I think about. And, you know, it's it's a bit wonky, but it, I love jellyfish. So how do you write music on a piano accordion <clears throat> uh, to go with jellyfish? It's kind of an interesting idea. And, um, and so that idea is then... I'm thinking about immersion in water. So how do I immerse the chords? How do I immerse the colour? How do I immerse that feeling of delicacy? Uh, I don't think much about them stinging. Everyone talks to me about jellyfish stinging. I don't. I just think they're beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> so I have a really, <clears throat> excuse me, a really nice time writing music with jellyfish. And 
going back to the whole colour thing um, because of the artwork, I think the best way to the best way to be creative for me at least is just to not worry. When I don't worry, mm. when I don't worry about what people think or what it's about. I just let myself be completely absorbed by whatever it is I'm trying to do. That might be a chord. It might just be a bit of fun. It might be, uh, uh, yeah, jellyfish. Let's go back to jellyfish again. Then I I can lose myself for hours Mm. just trying out different chords. I don't work with mathematics. I don't work with um, notes on paper. I, I have to work from the accordion and what that does because it's a breathing, living thing for me, the accordion. And if I play an accordion I don't like the sound of, I, I can't be creative on it. So so I find the best way for me to be creative is to not play music, is not to sit down with my accordion, but just to listen to other people and I read a lot and I knit and I live in this amazing place in Orkney where you've got skies that are incredible in 90 mile an hour gales and very calm seas sometimes and and all of that and amazing accents and things. So <laughs> I think you just you, you can't you can't get over you can't get overstimulated. Allow yourself to be completely and utterly stimulated and I and I go back to the same things again and again and again. You know, we were talking talking to you about Utla. You know, I, I just love their early early albums they were, they were just fabulous amazing yeah, so the what they were doing Norwegian band with Håkon Högmo and uh, Thierry Sungset Carl Seglem yeah and Håkon the way he plays the fiddle oh I could just listen to him forever I just think it's amazing so you know and I, I also love Arvo Pert I listen to Arvo Pert a lot at the moment and I listen to yeah I, I was some friends of mine sent me a, a great band called Go Go Penguin who are from Glasgow, okay. instrumental band. And I was listening to them. I think, oh, I really like this. It's quite drum and bass and all that. And uh, I was listening to it. And then I suddenly realised it was all based around a minor seventh. That's why I like it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I really like minor sevenths. Um, that's that's, but, me, that's know, probably why you like uh, Isn't She Lovely? <laughs> yeah, Isn't She Lovely? Because it's all minor sevenths. And then Karen Street, I started working with this fantastic accordion player called Karen Street, who actually, her married name is Karen Tweed as well, so that's quite funny. But she is a jazz accordion player and also a brilliant classical player and plays in theatre and stuff like that. And, her, and she's also a great saxophonist and a composer and arranger. And so she, we've started doing kind of Zoom lessons once a fortnight for anybody who wants to come and join, really. And we do all sorts of things. And she always brings in an element of jazz and looking at chords and making your playing quite interesting. And while we do look at uh, pop music and jazz and, and film music and classic kind of ideas, and sometimes I do a bit of folk music as well, the whole idea is to show people that if you play things slowly and listen to certain chords that you like, you mm. can start putting them into what you like. Somebody said to me the other day, I really like uh, the arrangement you did of... Uh, Moon River. We did Moon River one time. And I, and we were talking about writing your own music. I said, well, if you just look at Moon River, and she said, oh, and I love I love the chord changes. I love the chord. I said, well, just pick out two chord changes in Moon, Moon River from one chord to the next, and in another piece of Moon River, one one chord to the next, and then make that the first two bars of your, of your piece. Mm. It will work because it's worked before, and you're you you will go somewhere else. It will take you somewhere else. But you're start you're not starting with a blank piece of paper. It's like having a sketchbook. If you've got a sketchbook and it's got a white piece of paper, it can look at you forever and you can be so scared of making a mark yeah. on it. But if you just scribble on it, just scribble it straight away, you know, it suddenly it doesn't become this scary piece of paper anymore because you just made this silly this silly piece. And you can and you can make it into anything, as as you can see on thousands of YouTube videos. You know, it's about it's about being brave. It's about just saying, I don't care if anybody likes this. I'm just going to have some fun today. I'm going to write a tune about a spider. I'm going to write a tune <laughs> about my favourite chair, you know. Just, but there's, I, I went for a long period of thinking that you couldn't compose music unless you had a PhD in it or you were related to somebody like Beethoven or something. But everybody writes music. Look at folk music. Folk music's all, all been composed by somebody. We've just forgotten who they were. And some of the folk tunes, they are eternal because they're brilliant and maybe that person didn't even know it was going to be such an amazing tune they were just they just needed a tune because they were bored of playing a tune for their local dance so they started writing another tune i mean I, what how fab is that so you know just be inspired by everything and and don't worry when we we can't decide <clears throat> excuse me if our music is any good really um hopefully it is quite good but the the proof of the pudding is long after we're dead if it's still 
played and what mm. a great legacy to leave if one one bar of mine gets remembered or played after I'm gone I mean that's just amazing but what's even more important than that is if I can write music and that inspires other people to say well I'll give that a go I'll try writing a jig mm. I'll try writing a polska then that's very cool isn't it but I think we get a bit scared that it has to be as good as the 1812 overture or something that Robert yeah. Towers just played or something. I don't know. It is and it isn't about that. It's about having fun. It's about having having great fun and thinking thinking in different ways. Thinking mm. in different ways. That's all. No, but I, I can definitely recognize the uh like yeah, like just the feeling of like losing yourself in the project if it's writing a tune or uh um or f- yeah, working on some style or uh, and not worrying too much about what other people will think about it or having it fit in like I'm I'm in in my mind everything is like very strict and it's orderly and there's a lot of boxes and I have a tendency to whenever I'm writing a tune okay this has to be a cert- a, this kind of tune uh, uh-huh. and that's then it has to be like this and blah 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 but uh, the 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 best experiences I have with writing music and just coming up with music is when I'm able to just forget all of that uh, mm-hmm. and just um, yeah you know when you lose yourself you, you just realize you're onto something and you all you want to do is just explore that further and mm-hmm. um, and hours just fly by and hopefully you have something f- nice to show for it in the end but yeah that's yeah, personally that's 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 the feeling I'm kind of striving for or realizing more and more that I need to be striving for and it's really interesting hearing your, all of your perspectives on this uh, because I realize that it's probably one of your strengths that you're not afraid to follow all of these different paths wherever it takes you because you've been doing a lot of different stuff in your career. <laughs> <laughs> I get bored easily. I think that's what it is. No, it's not that. I don't get bored easily. I, I am, I'm just really interested and in love with everything I've decided. Hmm. There, I can't think of one thing at the moment that doesn't interest me you know it's just I think it's fascinating I think everything's fascinating I've got a young student who's 10 and he's just told me more about sheep and farming and (laughs) the weather and grasses different types of grasses oh it's just amazing he's 10 (laughs) he knows everything about nature he's fabulous that kid and uh he's going to be a great accordion player but I'm just fascinated by all of this kind of stuff I think there's so much out there for us to learn and and don't get me wrong, I've had lots of times in my life where I've really doubted what I've done. And and I think being in an industry, being in a music industry or any industry cultivates that because it's so competitive and it's based on who's selling what, how much, how mm. good and all that. And what is the criteria of best and good and all the rest of it? You know, it's kind of quite hard, really. But when I then have the courage and feel good enough just to laugh at myself and go, oh, I can't be bothered to make a CD. Let's just go and paint a picture <laughs> and not sell it. You know, I'm in the, I'm in the middle of um, painting my floors in my house and I, I've decided to do paintings on the floors. Oh, <laughs> it's a bit cool. of a bonkers idea. People paint their walls and murals and things, but I've started doing it on my floors and uh, and I'm doing my, my old walk to school and uh, it's oh, all gone a bit mad. But nice. it's great because I... It, when you're painting a floor instead of a ceiling or a wall, you're looking at the world in a different way. It becomes a different, a different thing, and you get very, yeah. I've been thinking anyway. So, so I, I, I don't know why I do this, but I, I tend to challenge myself in those kind of ways, and then get completely distracted <laughs> on something, and but that then feeds my music, and the mm. music then feeds the the art and the writing and the drawing and the reading and the knitting and the things like that really it's just um it's just it's it's so fun and when you think how short life is you know Mm. you can think of life being short or long but actually it's very short in the grand scheme of things when you think about dinosaurs and things like that we're (laughs) only here for a breath aren't we we're here for a breath so we kind of have to make the most of it really and that's and that's the great thing about being older you know i love getting older because less seems to matter in that way yeah i don't need to go touring anymore because there's loads of brilliant accordion players and female accordion players out there doing what I used to do 
and much better. <laughs> so I can stay at home now and just have fun. It's brilliant. And uh, I, I teach, so I, that's how I earn my money and uh, do little publications and yeah and 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 also i i just like inspiring people i like giving people co- the confidence to dare that's what i like to do i don't think i teach music really i just try to give people the confidence to be themselves because that's what my greatest teachers did for me and i mean that in a very loose way some of the people who taught me weren't meaning to teach me they were they were musicians i like timo and and ian carr and karina nomson and ulla beckstrom and all these fantastic people they they gave me so much in their way of being and their their sense of humor and their uh, what they like to explore. I mean, these are deeply, deeply hilarious people who just have a great time exploring their music and share it so openly with everybody. It's just incredible, you know. So if I can do that for somebody else, that's the most important thing. And uh, and and I've uh, one of the things I was going to talk to you about is these. I'm starting three residential courses in Orkney next year. One's in February, one's in March and one's in October in 2022. And they're small courses, they're just 13 places, fully residential. And I'm working with one other tutor. The first one was with a composer, a fiddle player called Jeff Moore, who's from the classical scene. And we're having a, an ensemble week. So it's open to any any musicians, no beginners, but anybody who plays anything, basically. Cool. And he's going to write a piece specifically for the people who come on the course. And I'm going to do a more hands-on approach so uh, there'll be notation and there'll also be times where you have to have a notebook and write down, if I say to you, you've got to go pling, pling, plong, plong, <laughs> <laughs> and we'll make it up as we go along. And uh, so that's in, in February. And in March, I'm doing a piano accordion course with Karen Street. Okay. Uh, that's going to be a great deal of fun. Um, and uh, then in October, I'm doing a course with Margaret Robertson, who's a fiddle player and piano player from Shetland. So uh, quite a variety of, of ideas will be zimming around. But the idea is to develop your way of playing, your listening, playing with other people, maybe a bit of improvisation and uh, daring and uh, and having a mm. lot of fun and exploring different tunes, different ideas, I suppose, really, in, in the beautiful landscape of Orkney. And there'll be time to have a look around Orkney as well because it is worth a look, of course. Yeah. Yeah, I've never been, but uh, I definitely hope to have an to have the opportunity to go there soon. Like, as I told you before, I uh, went on air, like where I live in, in Norway is uh, as far from the ocean as you can get in the whole of Norway. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, um, um, Do you think yeah. that affects your music? Do you think that affects your music <laughs> being landlocked? Mm, I think it might give it a certain flavor, yes. Uh, mm-hmm. But like, you don't think of it consciously? I think of everything consciously. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, but no, you that's not, that, no, you, that's, you that's not true. Like no, you were thinking of that no, that, you're right. <laughs> you're right. That's not true. But I mean, you're familiar with Norwegian music, so you know how uh, it's very different in the different parts of the country. Mm-hmm. Uh, and where I'm from, it's very, um, it's kind of uh, n- simple uh, in a good way, and and um, a lot of the tunes tend to be minor tunes. Or mm-hmm. at least reinterpret them as minor these days. Um, uh-huh. um, whereas... That's interesting because in Orca- in Orkney, Orcadian music. I've had, had quite a few conversations about Orcadian folk music. How does that differ from Shetland and from mainland Scotland? You know, mm-hmm. and the resounding feeling, similarly similarly to what you're saying, is that the music is quite simple. Yeah, that's an interesting word so much... in in musical terms. Anyway, it is. Yeah, it's very in- interesting because simple can also equate to some people as boring mm. or ordinary, whereas there's nothing boring or ordinary about Orcadian music nor Norwegian music, you know, because then if you have less notes, you have more time for tone and soulfulness, you know. It's, and I'm not saying slow is better than fast or, you know, more notes is better than less notes or whatever. I'm just saying it creates space. And I'm as I get older, I'm more interested in space because – Colour and light need to shine in space. So it's what I can take out of something. And that goes back to your point about can you overstate something? Well, if you listen to Astor Piazzolla, you know, he plays these very, very beautiful, sometimes these very beautiful, simple melodies, but it's what's happening in the harmony, which is really important. And that's the band. You know, the band are just like, whoa. Yeah. You know? So you don't you don't need to over 
you don't need to improvise on Astor Piazzolla, I don't think, because it's all in the harmony. For me, that's how I hear it. That's the colour. And maybe that's the same in what you're saying with your music. But in Orkney, these tunes are just, oh, you just gorgeous tunes. And they're, there's kind of nothing to them. But they're, again, they're just, they're there forever. They're there mm. forever, you know. Mm. Beautiful. And like, I find that the, the, the hardest tunes to write for me anyway is like, a slow waltz or or something like that because every note becomes so um you can see everything like when you mm. when you write uh if i write a fast reel or a faster tune if some of the new notes aren't like the most interesting ones like they'll they'll be gone in a second anyway then you know what i mean uh, but yeah. if you write a slow tune then everything becomes that much more important or like every note matters more in a way yeah, and maybe that's because you're opening your heart a bit more or something, you know. I mean, when, when you write tunes, what what do you think of these days? If I'm going to write a waltz, for example, I'm I'm really I've really got back into but what waltz? What kind of waltz? Mm. So I, I kind of have to imagine Do you ask yourself dancing. that? Okay. Do, yeah, so, yeah. Sorry, so is, is that I, something do you ask yourself these questions when you're sitting down? To write a tune yeah at the it's... moment yeah i've been asked to write a couple of tunes for people and so i need to envisage them dancing that waltz and what waltz do they because up here you know there's lots of different waltzes you know there's just like so many different types of waltz to dance mm. and uh, and they have different tunes and different types of tunes so it's not just any old waltz you know it's it's very connected to the weight in the body and the movement and whether it's fast or if it's more slow and sensual or whatever. And it's and it's also about those people. So I'm kind of, for a long time I've been thinking about, I write stories without words, which is great because then you don't give the game away and people can think what they like of the tune, they might like it or not like it. But I know the yeah. story, but they don't. You know? <laughs> and the story might not have anything to do with the title or anything, but it's, I, have, I have this ongoing video in my head of what's going on and uh, where I got, even even tunes I've learned from other people or traditional tunes, I've got a story in my head that goes on about oh, really? every single tune. Otherwise I can't huh. play it. I have to have a story hmm. going on and it doesn't have to be very detailed. I just have a, feeling about that tune mm. i have to befriend that i have to befriend that tune there's there's tunes i i suppose I, when we say i don't like a tune so i'm not playing it it's because that that tune i can't i can't find my connection with it. i can't find my friendship with it so i don't play it no i mean i might play it if we're in a session but i don't have a i don't have an engagement with it but most all the all the music i choose to play and you know that's a lot in over the years mm. and still i still revisit a lot of those tunes either traditional music or written by the people i have a very very personal connection to each of those stories in my head i don't know if they're actually true <laughs> <laughs> but they're my little you know when i was a kid i was always into cartoons i loved cartoons i could lose myself in cartoons i think most kids did actually but i still love cartoons and i still love those imaginative stories and do you have any favorites like, like what's what's your favorite cartoons Cartoon. Well, my, when I was a kid, I loved Tom and Jerry, and there was a there was a cartoon. Uh, I don't know if you ever saw it in Norway, but it's called Rhubarb and Custard. It was fantastic. It was about a dog and a cat and some birds, and the way it was all done in felt tips, and, and it used to shake. The screen used to shake. It was very bizarre. So I, yeah, I, I just like those. And more recently, things like the Wallace and Gromit and the Minions yeah. and yeah, yeah, that's that that's kind of, stuff. I love all, I love all that stuff. I could watch it forever. I just I think it's it, it's so clever. It's so clever and so hilarious and. Minimal movement and minimal, you know, the minions, one eye, a mouth, every mm. single emotion. Brilliant. Mm. Totally. Nice. And and that's our job, isn't it? We have 12 notes and we we could say any emotion in mm. that. Mm. And the simpler, and sometimes the simpler, the better, really. Yeah. It's amazing what, what, uh, what you can do, what variety of emotion you can bring out in only 12 notes it's, when you think about it it's quite awesome really yeah better not I mean, think about it just do it <laughs> yeah yeah well yeah yeah you would think like is there anything left to do but obviously there is uh, which is quite astonishing really like it is astonishing like is as astonishing. you said yeah. just 12 notes and all of these years with human innovation and ideas and, and still yeah as you said like the best is probably yet to come yeah. Uh, so, so similarly, we're just playing with a limited palette, aren't we? We've only got twelve notes. Mm. Wow. 
which is and look what music has happened you know and, and i know that means you can do octaves and all the rest of it but it's still only 12 notes it's not like 58 notes or 450,000 notes it's only 12 notes that's mm. quite something to think of a music that has already been written and played and the music that is still going to be written and played that's just quite mm. incredible really i think that's and it's lovely i just think yeah. it's really really lovely it goes around around and around and around it's fabulous mm. and recently uh, like I've, I just realized I'm so grateful <laughs> for like being able mm. to play music and just be a part of this, yeah, legacy basically, and like um, feeling that I can find maybe my own little carve out, my own little space in this whole thing, and and as you say, like maybe some of the stuff I do will have a life after I'm dead. I don't know, but that's yeah, just to be able to. Con- contribute like one small part in this whole grand scheme of um human art making is uh yeah it's quite a gift actually when you stop to reflect on it oh it's beautiful that's a really beautiful thing to say i think it's lovely and i i didn't get that for so many years just how grateful and and thankful i am to to play music and to mm. draw and to look and to listen and uh yeah just appreciate it all it is amazing we are so we have so much at our fingertips and everybody does everybody can sing or whistle or 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 enjoy dancing to music or or whatever being creative is it's it is fantastic i just think it's yeah. yeah it's very important to be aware of that i think and i i came to that quite late to be very grateful for it but i am now i think it's yeah. i think it's amazing and that helps you then to play, perform, or write better because you realize that the gift of being grateful for that is to pass it on to somebody else. Yeah. Whether just to, for them to listen to or or to enable them to go, come on, try this, it's great. Yeah. <laughs> That's all it's about, isn't it, really? Yeah, and, and just so, to, uh, to really feel that connection that, like, uh, yeah, because, like, back in the pandemic days, which is still ongoing, I guess, but... Like I realized how much it means to me to actually show the stuff I do to someone else. Like I, I make music for my own, for like for myself. But uh, the real magic kind of um, comes to light when you can share it with someone else, uh, and you have that uh, the energy going back and forth. It's uh, for me at least. I re- I've realized more and more that that's such an important part of the thing for me anyway. It's very it, and it's very important. It's very beautiful. I I struggled with that for a while because I just wondered why do I need to perform? Why do I need to put music out there or anything really? <clears throat> Is that just a big ego trip? Mm. But actually, there's something about I've got this fantastic lolly and I want you to have some. Yeah, <laughs> I want you to taste this lolly. It's great. Listen to this. Well, look at this. You know, it's just that thing when you when you, you it's 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 sharing joy. That's all it is. It's just sharing joy, and that's and if you can then share joy and get people to make their own joy, well, even better. That's mm. that's really what it is. But I've just made a, an album with uh, Margaret Robertson, the fiddle and a piano player. I was telling you about from Shetland, and we met thirty eight years ago at the Shetland Folk Festival, and I loved her piano. Now going talking about piano backing, I loved her piano backing. These really amazing chords and wonky ideas. So it's taken us 38 years to get around to making this album that we wanted to make, you know, which was just tunes and having fun, really. No big arrangements, just doing what she does and I do. And uh, it's of all, all of our own compositions. We were going to play a lot of the traditional stuff that we we can play together. But we, I realised that she has got this vast amount of amazing tunes that nobody's really heard. And uh, so that's what we've done. And it's going to be out in December. And, oh, great. Uh, it's so a right lot of fun. The corner. Nice. A lot of fun, but it's more, it's more kind of traditional than I've done in a long time, and uh, and it's also <laughs> slightly more wonky. So I don't know how you describe <laughs> it really, oh. but it's piano chord and piano and fiddle, and nice. uh, yeah, see you can see what you think. It's called Island Girls Beach Days. So so you'll get all of the information, all the things I've been talking about, on my website, and uh, maybe the nice. jellyfish will appear soon too. Make sure to put it in the show notes as well. Okay. So. I'm not going to keep you much longer, but I, I just a couple of things I wanted to ask you about. What 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 are you listening to these days? What am I listening to? Well, the the CD I'm look, listening to a lot at the moment is called uh, what is called. I'm going to have to go and get it, but it's by Chris. Um, 
Katrina Mackay and Alistair MacDonald. Okay. Hmm. And it's, let me just go and get it because it's just right over there. One second. It's called When Feathers Appear. It's just come out a few months ago. Okay. And it's, it was a lockdown CD. And it's um, Alistair MacDonald is a contemporary composer. And Katrina Mackay, a lot of you will know, is a fantastic harp player. And it's one of the most beautiful, beautiful albums. I have it on every day at the moment. I think it's fantastic. I've, and I'm also revisiting La Bottine Souriant. Oh, what's that? I'm not familiar with. Uh, La Bottine Souriant are a Quebec band. They've been going okay. for quite a long time. Um, fantastic. And it's one of their older albums I'm listening to called Jusqu'au Petit Heure. Uh, Stevie Wonder, of course. And <laughs> I've also, two other albums I'm listening to currently. One is is uh, The Cure, Greatest Hits, fantastic pop band yeah, of, a long time fun. ago. I'm a big fan of Robert Smith. And <laughs> and then the last one, of course, is Tabula Rasa by Arvo Pert. That's on my playlist at the moment. Nice. Cool. Um, and I also want to ask you, uh, what who's your favorite artist, like in, in the art world of all time? Well, the one <laughs> interestingly, the one who springs to mind immediately is a guy called Francis Bogue. Okay. B-O-A-G, Francis Bogue. He's from Aberdeenshire, and I absolutely love his paintings. He does landscapes. He does all sorts of things, but he does landscapes of near where he lives with the idea that he's been and seen those landscapes over many times, many seasons. So they're very, very intense, brightly coloured. He's probably known as one of the Scottish colourists, I would imagine, but he's he's fabulous, Francis Bogue. And um, I just like... Oh, my art ideas change daily. I just love everybody. Egon Schiele's a big fan of his drawings. I'm reading a book on Leonardo da Vinci at the moment. That's really oh, interesting. Cool, nice. And uh, and cartoons. Yeah, the Beano. I used to love all the Beano stuff. Big fan of different cartoons and the Far Side cartoons. And there was there was a he's dead now, but there was a British cartoonist, English cartoonist called Giles. And okay. I love he did a diff, a political cartoonist. Fantastic. It's like f- fun, funny stuff. Mm-hmm. Okay, cool. Have to check that out. Uh, <laughs> like, I really like the 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 far side, like Gary Larson, right? That's Gary Larson's that's amazing. Yeah. That's yeah. I don't know how what what goes on in his head. <laughs> it's pretty. It's pretty out there, isn't it? Yeah. But it is great. It's really cool. <laughs> um, but anyway, um, thanks for uh, taking the time to to come on the show. I I figured this show would be mostly about nerdy according details, but it turned out to be a lot more about uh, just uh, finding your place in this world as a musician and human being so I really love it I like inspiring stuff and I hope we can inspire other people to uh, yeah follow their passion and and have a great life yeah that's, yeah, all, that's what I it's all about pod- isn't it I think your podcasts do that I, th- I think it's great you're doing these podcasts They're, it's so interesting to hear people talk about their creativity and it's all about self value and believing in ourselves and all of us have problems with that i think along the way but at the end of the day just have fun it's the best yeah let's uh, let's call that our conclusion and um i'll make sure to link to all of the stuff we've been talking about on um the the podcast website and um yeah uh, where if people want to to learn more about your uh, your work and and your music where's the best place to do that just go straight to my website karentweed.com that we will be there Cool. Okay, Karen, thanks for um, coming on the show and I hope to see you again soon. Brilliant. Lovely, lovely to have done this and thank you so much for asking me. I really appreciate it.